All right. Welcome, everybody, to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and this is Matt. We are your hosts for this important event. This is day one, session one of our Defending Genesis Conference 2023. It is an absolute privilege to have Dr. Dan Biddle from Genesis Apologetics, one of our favorite go-to creation ministries, to kicking off this epic presentation conference. Dan, it's no secret, my brother, you're a fan favorite. This is certainly not your first time here on the program. And as a matter of fact, your last presentation with us months ago has accumulated over 18,000 views between our two channels. And Dan, I know how busy you are, my brother, defending the truth of biblical creation. And so I want to thank you for offering your time for this presentation. Yep. You're welcome, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yes, my pleasure. This is going to be great. Uh, I'm excited for your presentation. I know the audience is as well. Before we get into the presentation, though, I'm going to hand it to Matt for a formal introduction. Yeah, thanks again, Dan, for coming. Dr. Dan Biddle here is a behavioral scientist uh, and HR consultant with a doctorate in industrial organizational psychology. He is the president of Genesis Apologetics, equipping pastors, parents, and students with biblical answers to evolutionary teaching. Dan has trained thousands of students in biblical creation and evolution issues and is the author of several creation-related publications. His professional background includes 20 years of experience in expert witness consulting testimony in state and federal cases involving statistical research methods and psychometrics. He maintains an ex executive role in two HR consulting and test development firms. While Daniel has uh, been a Christian since age 11, he says that his position on the specific chronology of Genesis was uh, undeclared until 2011, when the evidence surrounding the fossil record, dinosaurs in particular, flood geology, and biblical exegesis led him to the historical position on the Genesis account. Awesome. Matt, thank you for the uh, formal introduction. Before I hand it to Dan, I do want to remind everybody that, yes, we're doing this live, of course. And so we will take about 15 minutes after Dan's presentation for a few audience questions. We want to make sure they're uh, relevant to the topic and just make sure to tag me at Standing for Truth. And also, this is uh, day one, session one of our Defending Genesis conference. So we will be back here uh, a couple hours after this show with Matt for a presentation on the animals of Noah's Ark. And then we'll be back tomorrow with uh, John Mackay and Joseph Hubbard. So with that, uh, Dr. Dan, I'll hand it over to you, brother. I know we've got a teaser of your uh, much anticipated movie coming up if you wanted to introduce that. All right. That sounds good. Well, guys, thank you very much for having me on. And uh, everyone should know I was having a sidebar talk with Matt before they were putting us on today. And it's just, um, I just, I'm here today with a sense of gratitude because I feel like the Lord's given uh, a, the gift to me and the form of a key to understanding the truth of earth history. And I remember for years, there's a there's a lake around my house. I would ride my bike around and there's all kinds of, of uh, post-flood geology there. And there's polystrate stuff that's going on and there's ash levels and there's all these rounded river rocks. And, and for years I would ride my bike around this lake and just have no idea how in the world did that get there and when and where and how does it fit in, in, in earth history and the, and the biblical history and everything. But now I can say firmly, that I've been given the key for understanding earth history through uh, my, my willingness to submit to God's word. So when I submitted to God's word and I stood under the authority of scripture, it's kind of like leaning down low and going below a, a limbo bar, you know, if you will. And, uh, and if you can do that and you approach scripture with the humility of a child, I think God gives us uh, the gift of understanding origins because it takes a, a humble spirit to be able to look at, at, at the Bible's case for creation and six days and just thousands of years of history and everything and ignore the barrage of information that the world gives us that's an alternative view. And when I personally made that shift just over 10 years ago now, it's been such a blessing. And, and now I feel like I've been born again, again, because now my mind can join the heart party that I, that my faith has been having since I was a teenager. But my mind's always was always kind of dragging behind like an anchor on my faith because I was always questioning, well, what about the Neanderthals and are, are there gaps? And what about millions of years and all these things? But now that 
that uh, I've got a true understanding of history because I've been willing to submit and humble myself under God's word. And what a gift it is. It's a gift individually and a gift for raising uh, my family under the authority of scripture also. So what a, what a neat ministry you guys are doing and, and to present and promote this truth is going to change lives because Jesus was really true when he said the truth will set you free. It certainly did that. Amen. So, um, Amen. Praise the Lord, brother. Yeah, thank you. With that, I think we are going to start with um, with a quick intro. We have a movie coming out at about 900 plus theaters this March 20th and 21st. We've worked in cooperation with Sevenfold Films. A friend of mine, our, our producer and, and director, Ralph Stren, over at Sevenfold Films, has worked on this movie for well over two years. Um, we've worked on the research on it for over a decade. And it will be coming out to, to about 900 theaters as a Fathom event. And, uh, and then after that, it will go on different uh, BOD platforms or video on demand platforms. And after that, it's going to go free on YouTube for everyone. So I thought we would put in a, a sneak preview of that uh, of the teaser now. And then uh, we'll have more content as it comes out. But this is a pretty cool teaser. Just came out a couple of weeks ago. So I thought Donnie would show this as a way to intro our movie because that's what we're talking about today is Noah's Flood. So he's pulling this from a website that's just called noahsflood.com, and that's our main movie page, just Noah's Flood, with no apostrophe S, just noahsflood.com. Thanks for, for rolling that, Donnie. Awesome. Actually, and, and what I'll do, just to make sure there's no feedback as the trailer plays, is I'm going to mute all of us starting now, and we'll enjoy the, the teaser. Dan, I appreciate that. Here we go. In March of 2024, an incredible film will be coming to theaters across the United States. A film that will take you from the creation of the earth and the heavens. To Adam and Eve and their disobedience against God and the fall of mankind. It will take you through the worldwide flood of Noah's time and will explain what really happened to the dinosaurs. It will show incredible evidence that proves the biblical account of history is true. It will explain what happened at the Tower of Babel and how mankind arrived where we are today. It will explore the coming Antichrist system and what's next on the prophetic timeline. And most importantly, you will learn how to be saved in Christ and avoid the next judgment of the earth. The film is the ark and the darkness. Please make a tax-deductible donation at the site below. Dan, <clears throat> that was an awesome trailer. Um, right. I hope it all came in good, audio and everything. It did. <clears throat> I think we missed a lot of the of, of the sound. At least I, I did on my side, but. Uh, yeah, it's it's an exciting movie, you guys. We're we're really really excited to do it. We filmed it uh, at uh, Answers in Genesis Ark Encounter and Liberty University. They've been real cooperative to work with us in, in this regard. We're super excited for it to come out. But you know, here's a a, a sneak up attack on my on my talk here coming up. If you just take the one thing you saw in the trailer, the topic of dinosaurs, and if you were to erase all the textbooks and and, and erase the Bible. 
and plop yourself down in the middle of America where 14 states basically constitute a massive dinosaur graveyard. And you were to helicopter down there 500 years ago before anyone's dug anything up and grab a shovel and start digging, you'd quickly find layer after layer after layer of, of dead dinosaurs. And you'd find them buried in three products, mud, sand, and ash. And if you can imagine yourself in the six foot tunnel that you just dug down and you're finding a t-rex and the whole time you've been digging through those three products mud sand and ash it would become extremely obvious to you that these creatures didn't die in a fire they didn't die from the chicxulub asteroid they died in a flood they're buried in three products and this big technical term taphonomy or the study of the conditions in which an animal died is you don't have to be a paleontologist to figure out. It's quite obvious that something buried them in mud, which is, of course, a, a you know watery sediment, earth suspended in water, and then it goes away, and then they're left in this mud. Sand, which can be caused from bringing up tsunami waves from the ocean floor and bringing it up in systematic layers up onto the earth. And then ash. I, I wonder where the ash came from. Well, ash, which is a, in, in dinosaur matrix all over the world, is from plate subduction causing volcanic hazards along the coastal lines on either side of America. Because if you look, for example, in the, in the southern part of California. And, and Dan, I just large, wanted to I just want to, yeah, I, apologize. I wanted to make yeah. sure you weren't looking to share a screen yet or not, not yet. Okay. I'll, I'll finish this point. Then we'll, then we'll share the screen. No, rush, just so, wanted to make yeah, no problem. So if you go, if you look in Southern California, there's a 370 mile, 75 mile stretch of a linear fissure there. It's called the independence dike swarm and secular geologists are saying that one fissure in Southern California on the Eastern Cascades emit more ash than any, almost any other uh, volcanic system known in the world. The Deccan Traps are in another, another big one, but certainly in, in America. 4,000 cubic miles of ash, and it belted out all that ash, and it pillowed all, all over uh, North America and covered about half of the United States. And that's why you can find regions like, uh, like Utah that are just stuffed with ash layers, 10, 20, 30 feet thick, that just goes for miles of just ash. So how did all that ash get there? And then why are the dinosaurs buried in the layers of ash? Think about time and sequence. Layers of ash from this event mixed up with mud and sand at the same time. So the only thing, and I'll be bold to say this, the only explanation that makes any sense is catastrophic plate tectonics. When you have newly forming seafloor from the fountains of the Great Deep bursting open, they're rapidly subducting underneath the land masses, and they're causing huge volcanics along the coastal regions that are causing all this ash to come bellowing out and bury the dinosaurs along with mud and sand. And if I could just stop right there in a five-minute coffee conversation and really stay on just those points and just those evidences, I don't think there's anyone that could ever get away from that table and not believe in young Earth creation in a recent flood. It's really impossible if you're going to be obvious with, with, with the evidence, because then if you look further at that dinosaur that you dug up in the six-foot tunnel that you made yourself and put it in a laboratory – why would you find 16 different varieties of fresh organic materials that are still intact in that dinosaur if it's 65 million years old? It's not possible. There's no other explanation. And that's why the Bible's clear that the truth has been obfuscated. It's been hidden. The world has so beat people up with millions of years and the Chicxulub asteroid and the dinosaurs and the extinction that they can't see what's incredibly obvious. If you just put away all the books and all the TV channels and just helicopter down in the middle of America, you could almost figure it out for yourself because it's that obvious. So um, we will go into the talk now. I'll go ahead and share the screen and then we'll go into some of that evidence in a more, more specific way. Amen. Well said so far, Dan. Oh, thank you. That's kind of one thing that we will um, focus on. So let, let's see if we can get this just uh, out of the presenter mode here. And hopefully you should just have, let's see, 
uh, is that, uh, that's, oh, that's my screen showing up here. Yeah. Okay. Let me go back. Okay. Perfect. How about now? So do you guys just see only my, my screen? Yes. Looks great. Okay. The Genesis flood, amazing evidence. Yes. Terrific. Okay. So we will start here and go through. So just a little bit about, uh, with that introduction, of course, <laughs> we'll go back to the beginning. Um, so a little bit about our ministry. So um, we do have several feature films uh, that, that are out on different VOD platforms, and they're all also free on YouTube, but you can go check those out on our website. Um, we have a, a pretty significant social media following. We have about 176,000 subscribers now, I think, on, on YouTube. We get between 50 and 100,000 views a month, and we just crossed over 20 million views total. Um, we do give a lot of talks to, um, to local Christian schools and colleges, all the way from K to 12, and we do some colleges as well. Uh, we give probably 30 to 50 church or chapel presentations uh, every year, and then we have an annual conference that we do in conjunction with uh, David Reeves and ICR. Uh, Randy Galuza comes out as the president of ICR. This will be his, his second year uh, to come out with us and help us with our conference. We do have one of our, my favorite books is called The Answers to the Top 50 Questions about Genesis, Creation, and Noah's Flood, because every year we get literally hundreds of questions that come in through our channel, and we did that for, for years until we start, you know, we have developed all these kind of cut and paste answers that we'd get modified as we go and answer everyone's concerns. But then we noticed, gosh, there's sure a consistent theme. People are just asking the same thing over and over and over again. We took the top 50 ones, developed videos for maybe 12 or 15 of these top uh, questions, but we put it all in a book that can be downloaded free from our website. And uh, we have about 120,000 people that have downloaded our mobile app. So you can just go to the Google Play or iTunes store and just type in Genesis Apologetics. And you can get our free mobile app that actually plums into our, our YouTube videos. So that's a great way to get access to our even our new videos when they come out. And here's we just the, the, the preview that we just saw on the Ark in the Darkness coming to theaters uh, next year, March 20th. Uh, 20, 20th and 21st so uh that should be uh that should be real fun that it's going to go on tv for tv for about 90 days and then it will also uh, come out free on youtube in a low res version but we're excited about the theater version that's going to be coming out we already watched that preview oh and there is a book about it also i skipped past um that book but um our book is called uh also called the ark in the darkness and, uh, and that can be downloaded, I think, from noahsflood.com as well. So, um, so here's our topic today, guys. Um, Noah's, Noah's Ark, the flood, uh, did it really happen? And why did it have to happen? And when did it happen? And what evidence is there that it went, really went down, especially in the way that the Bible says? So these are the, the core central questions we'll be focusing on today. And if Noah's flood happened, Here's what we would expect. We would expect that about where the ark landed in the mountains of Ararat, the Bible doesn't say it landed on the mountain of Ararat, on the mountains of Ararat. But if that's the case, right in that same region, we would expect a whole bunch of flood myths and legends to start in that geography and then spider out around the world. And that's exactly what we see with these ancient Near Eastern mythologies and legends. Some of them are on clay tablets. Some of them are on clay tablets, plus a lot of oral traditions. But we have things like the Gilgamesh epic, the Iridu tablet, the Sumerian king's list, Enuma Elish, after Hashis, the Simmons Ark tablet. For some reason, in this hot spot in the world, right where the Bible says the Ark landed and the Tower of Babel happened, we have all of these accounts of the flood or echoes of the flood going out around the world. And they're written on things like this on, on cuneiform clay tablets. And there's a lot of argument that goes on about the, the dating of these clay tablets and which one precedes what. But really, the Bible is the only believable account. If you look at something like the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, you have uh, the angry gods make a flood and only last seven days. And, and there's a whole bunch of myth mythological elements that are in that account that are obviously myth. Whereas if you look at the Bible, it's a real ship with real dimensions, with real physical feasibility and a flood that lasted 371 days so there it's very very obvious which one's the original one it's the biblical one and the rest of these are echoes of the actual uh real account that happened in history 
How do we know that? Well, isn't it interesting that if you start tracing these things back, back like branches or roots on, on a tree, you find some common trunks. And the common trunk is really the biblical account. Most of these ancient Near Eastern accounts of the flood have things like there's a God who's going to punish people. There's one chosen or one chosen family. Uh, the animals are going to get saved. There's a vessel that's built with certain spe uh, specifics. They're going to survive the flood. The birds are going to find dry land, and there's going to be a sacrifice to God or the gods afterwards. Uh, interesting, uh, a guy named Nick uh, just did, did a book called Echoes of Ararat, where he's got over 300 documented accounts of echoes or legends from the flood in North and South America alone. So after the flood happened, these cultures and, uh, and people groups that spread out from Babel carried that account with them and went all over the world with it. Here's his book. It's called Echoes of Ararat. And uh, it's got a forward by, by Ken Ham. And this book is incredible because if you just were to go up from Iridu and you see all of these dots around the globe, and as I spin the globe, you're going to see what happened in North America. Every one of these is a separate, distinct account of the flood legend. Look at all of those people, groups, and culture that, that themselves have accounts and legends about Noah's flood. And some of them are uncanny. They have an incredible, undeniable overlap with the biblical account. Sometimes even the name Noah sounds the same. So all over the world, we have exactly what we would expect. We have over 300 accounts of flood legends that span back thousands of years. So great evidence there. We would also expect to find things like this. Here's Leonardo, a, a duckbill dinosaur and a, or an, an Edmontosaurus, and it's been mummified, and they can find out what this creature was still eating. Look how fresh and preserved this dinosaur mummy is. They opened up its gullet and found furs and ferns and magnolia, all kinds of stuff that it was still eating that we can still tell what it is today right inside of its gullet. That's not a 65 million year old dinosaur. It's a dinosaur that's just over 4,000 years old that was that perished in the flood. That's uh, Leonardo is one of uh, maybe half a dozen mummies that we've now found of these dinosaurs. So this is also what we would expect to find is all kinds of fossil beds. So all of these little green dots, I believe this is just a Cretaceous and the Jurassic fossils that, that have been found all over the world. Every one of those little dots is not just an isolated dinosaur or an, or an isolated fish. Most of those dots are mass boneyards or graveyards. And some of them in the middle of America, where you can see that whole section where you've got a massive dinosaur kill zone, uh, the evolutionists would pitch that as the Western Interior Seaway. But no, it's when America became a giant bathtub during the flood and all those creatures died uh, because there's a lot of subduction on, on the East Coast and on the West Coast. So let's look at a quick overview of Genesis and the flood for those of us who aren't really familiar with uh, with the story. So because a lot of people, when you talk about Noah's flood, they think, well, it just rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Well, that's just what happened during part of the flood. But the actual, the, the waters, if you read Genesis 6 through 9, the waters prevailed upon the earth and didn't zenith or hit the cap until about 150 days. And then the earth, the, you know, the earth dried out in the last 70 days. And then the water subsided for about 150 days. So you have different stages of the flood that are narrated in the Genesis accounts. It lasted over a year. Eight people were saved and pairs of all land-dwelling, air-breathing animal kinds were saved. Certainly, you could not put all the species today on the ark. We're talking about the original kind, which in biology is generally at the at the family level. Sometimes it can get down a, a little bit closer towards the species, but it depends on, on each creature. It preceded the Ice Age because, again, another really obvious thing with the Ice Age is you need a trigger, a mechanism to put the Ice Age in place. Noah's Flood is perfect for that because you have hot oceans, you have evaporations, you have aerosol from, from, uh, from volcanoes, and you have time. So the, the Ice Age, the one Ice Age that we has, had was in full force about 100 years after the flood and lasted for about 900 years. So it's about a thousand year uh, process for, for the Ice Age. It happened after the flood, but of course the flood is what triggered it. Um, you know, and if, if the flood 
didn't happen, we have a credibility issues with the rest of the other Bible writers, including Jesus himself. Because look at all these people that talked about the flood. We've got Moses wrote about the flood extensively, and Peter, and Paul, and Jesus. And if you take the, all of Scripture and look through Noah's flood, you're going to find it referenced to, even in the Psalms and all these different books. So if this didn't happen, we're dealing now with the credibility of Christ himself, and Peter, and Paul. So yeah, you can stake a lot of, uh, a lot of weight uh, and a lot of burden on the flood. But for me, it's really a check the box issue because it's quite obvious that it happened. Why is it important in the mind of the believer? Well, I think it's a root level foundational thing because if you can't believe and trust in God's word back from the beginning, you're going to end up with a stunted tree of your faith. What's happening widespread to millions of Christians today is rather than believing and trusting in the Bible with both their heart and their mind, they're being stuck. They're saying, I can't believe the Bible. What about science versus the Bible? Or Charles Darwin, what about millions of years? Or aped human evolution? Uh, and what ends up happening is if you want to have good fruit as a Christian, it, it's all about your root systems. The bark's not responsible for the fruit and the twigs and the leaves, they all play their part. But if you had stunted roots and your roots aren't going deep, you're not going to bear fruit. And that's exactly what's happening with Christians today. They're not evangelizing or witnessing because they themselves, in many cases, aren't even convinced of the historicity of God's word. And where does God's word start? It all begins with what the Jewish folks call a Bereshit or Genesis, the very, very beginning. So trusting God's word is very, very important. Uh, Jesus even said, Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, and Jesus is the Logos, you know, the word of God responsible for, you know, God spoke creation in, into existence. He, he spoke through the Logos. Through That's what John 1 talks about. So Jesus says, look, if you're ashamed of me or my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and glory of the Father of the, and of the holy angels. And the Bible also promises that how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of Yahweh and his law or Torah. He meditates day and night. If you look at what that word law means in English, in this context is talking about the Torah. Here's a person that even the Psalms is just chuck full of wisdom. 150 Psalms, just amazing, deep, deep stuff. It starts out with this verse and says, look, if you want to be like a tree that's going to grow straw, strong, because that's the next section that talks about this. It's got leaves are always going to be green. It's never going to have fear in a time of, of, of drought. You really have to have delight in the Torah, which means delighting in the historicity of God himself, knowing that he's the maker. And then Psalms continues and says, he, the person who trusts in God's word or in Torah, will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever it does, he prospers. You guys, these days, we can't trust the stock market. We can't trust the government in many cases. We don't know what's going on with the world. But you can sit and meditate on God's word and reflect back on his Torah. Because if God got the beginning parts right of scripture, he's going to get the end times of scripture right also. And that's exactly why the psalmist is saying, I take comfort. I don't have anxiety. I can meditate. I can let my roots go all the way down into scripture. And I'm going to meditate on Genesis because what he did there shows me he's provident over the whole earth and all of its systems. So I think trusting in Genesis has huge implications uh, on our faith. And second Peter, this, this is just amazing. If you were just, just think about these first couple sentences here, second Peter, he's on his way out. And he says, says this, knowing this first of all, he says, Hey guys, of everything I've written, just pay attention to this one thing. In the last days, these scoffers are going to come and they're going to be mocking they're going to be following after their own lust, and they're going to say, hey, where is the promise of Jesus is coming? For since all the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. But then the Bible says when they maintain this, it escapes their notice, the, their obvious notice, that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed 
out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed being deluged with water. So modern English translation here, it says, remember this, that in the last times, people are going to come scoffing, saying two things. We deny creation out of nothing or ex nihilo. So we're going to deny that God spoke creation and we're going to deny a worldwide flood. And there's not a college degree that you can get today from any secular school in America, bold statement, but it's true. Even if you get a, a degree in art appreciation from any school in America, you're going to be required to take some general education classes that will jam this down your throat, that will make sure that you know, because you're going to have to take geology, maybe anthropology or biology, and you're going to hear over and over and over again, there's no creation, no creator, and there's no flood. You're going to learn about uniformitarianism in millions of years. And here's the Bible 2,000 years ago, dead set prophesies it and says in the end days, this is exactly what's going to happen. And this is prevalent all over uh, the world today. Okay, so let's talk about when was the flood. Um, there's a little bit of contention on this. Uh, not in my mind. I think there's some scholarly debates that can have or some academic debates that can, that can be had. I know for sure it happened, and I can tell you that it happened within these bracketed time frames and not before and not after. But if you just follow our Masoretic textual tradition, you're going to end up with a, with a flood date of about 2350 or so BC or 2348 BC. That's a traditional 6,000 years creation. There's some things that you can do with, with Abraham's birth and lifespan that might push it back to 2518 or so. Or you can follow the Septuagint textual tradition, uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And there are some valid academic reasons for, for considering that. And you can push the flood date back from maybe 3200 BC. Uh, I think the jury's still out on these issues. I think a lot of people get really hung up on the uh, on making wanting to choose one date over the other. Uh, but a friend of mine said, look, Dan, those aren't really the ranges for the for the flood. It's either that date or this date. And I appreciate what he's saying there. So either one of these dates would say that all of creation was made about 6,000 years ago or 7,800 years ago. And that's why the, the young earth orthodox position is that we believe earth is less than 10,000 years old, really uh, less than 8,000 years old. But that's the, the time range for, for Noah's flood. And how big was it? Well, if you compare it to the Queen Mary or the Titanic, uh, here you see Noah's, Noah's Ark below there. Um, there's some, some differences that you can do with the size of the cubit, which is the top of your, of your finger to your elbow. There's the Egyptian one and, and a more uh, Middle Eastern one that can say Noah's Ark was going to be between about 450 feet to 510 feet, and then by 50 by 80. But certainly a, a seafaring worthy, seaworthy ship that was, uh, that was tough enough to endure about 150 days at sea before the water began subsiding, and then it, uh, it landed. So it was at sea for about, about 300 days. So what about all the animals? Well, we hear this all the time. In fact, I was speaking at a high school group, and I, I didn't know it at the time, but the, the person that was following my presentation actually took a, a, a huge run against our presentation. And I wish I would have known in advance he was going to do that because he, he his first claim to these high school students was, well, we know that Noah's flood wasn't really a literal thing. And he was saying this in church to the high school students because you can't put 1.5 billion species on a big boat. And then he went on to his next step. And I'm like, oh my gosh, if you're going to criticize our position, at least know what our position is. And our position has never been that you got to jam a million species on the ark, not even not even 100,000, not even 10,000 species. Most experts today would say fewer than 3,000 animal varieties had to be on Noah's Ark to reproduce all of the varieties that we see today. Some go more than that. Some even try to take it a little bit less. But let's just do an a little exercise here. If you look at Canis lupus, which is the wolf kind or the dog kind, well, there's about 339 breeds of dogs today. They're all interfertile. Uh, you've got 336 breeds of horses, but you can take a small dwarf horse and it can mate 
with some of the largest horses. They're of the same kind. And the bear family is interesting, the Ursidae family. There are eight species in the Ursidae family. Five of those species are still interfertile. You can take a polar bear and a black bear and a brown bear. They're, they can all still interbreed. Chickens, same thing, 68 different varieties. They're all still interfertile. But if you take these examples here, like a, the twigs on a tree and go backwards, you can see quickly how we can scale from what the, the wide diversity of animals we see today all the way back to the common root kinds. And you only need a few thousand animal varieties to be on the ark. So let's look at some key flood verses here. Genesis 7, 11 says that in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, and if we were just to stop here, this is not a myth book. It's not reading like a myth book. It's reading like a historical diary of someone who actually went through this process because he says on that same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. So we have a subterranean event. We have something happening underneath the, the, the great deep. And these fissures are breaking open. And we believe that's the 40,000 mile mid-oceanic ridge system, all broken up at the same day and allowed all kinds of catastrophe on Earth. So something happened on the ocean floor. Then the floods uh, uh, zenith or peaked about 150 days into the process. The Bible says 15 cubits upward were about 22 feet did the waters prevail and all the mountains were covered. So if you could just pick a verse to say, yeah, the flood was a worldwide universal flood, that's the one to take because water seeks an even plane. And here we have one place that says, the, all the, the high hills under all of heaven were covered with 22 feet of water. There's only, it's also about 60 other textual, textual cues that would indicate it was a worldwide universal flood. But here's what it would have looked like when the fountains of the great deep broke open. You have these fissures coming out and then bursting out in linear steam jets that would have created pouring water that would have come down torrentially. And then we have the earth starting to tear apart. The earth continents were once pushed together in a Pangea-like format. And, uh, and then they were pushed apart when the fountains of the great deep broke open. Here's what it looks like with Dr. John Baumgartner's work with his software program called Terra. He was actually able to model it. He knows exactly where these continents were, how quickly they pushed apart. Uh, today, they're still moving in the direction in which they originally spread, but only a few inches a year at most. Uh, but during the flood, they would have been moving between three and five miles per hour as they're getting pushed apart as a newly formed seafloor from the fountains of the great deep breaking open are pushing these land continents apart and creating cycles of tsunamis that are coming up onto land. Here's a Mid-Atlantic Ridge if we take a look at it on a bathymetric map, which is from National Geographic on the right side of your screen there. Look at how much elevation we have here going on with the fountains of the Great Deep. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge alone is about 10,000 miles, and it's obvious that that process, that step, those characteristics you can see there on that big scar underneath the ocean is what pushed those land continents apart right in the middle, and it catastrophically buried the dinosaurs and all the creatures on either side of those continents, and we can see that scar on Earth today. Here's what the process looks like. So you have the newly formed sea floor coming up. It's creating new, new sea floor. It's coming down. It's hitting the landmass and it's subducting underneath it. And when that happens, it's going to subduct underneath the landmass, build up tension, and it's going to bind and bind, and then it's going to release and snap back, just like it happened today in Hindi and Japan. Same mechanism. When that happens, it's going to bring wave after wave of these massive tsunamis that are going to come up on land. And that's why we see the dinosaurs buried in stratified layers, because these huge, you know, continent covering tsunamis were coming up and retreating, coming up and retreating. In fact, there's one that they just discovered called the Tannis Bed. Uh, in North Dakota, where they've actually tracked two different massive tsunamis that came up and then retreated, came up and retreated, even though the directions from which it came. 
amazing evidence. It's all over the place. So here's what happened in Japan when there was a 60 foot seafloor slip. Look, just that one tsunami that we all know about in Japan where the seafloor slipped because it was still deducting, uh, sub -sub subducting. It slipped, caused that tsunami to come up on land. And look at the aftermath of just what by flood standards would be a very minor tsunami, but these were going on wave after wave after wave during the flood, hundreds of these cycles of tsunamis all over the world. So we know this because we have the dinosaur kill zone right in the middle of America. We have 14 states buried with millions and millions of creatures, three partial countries and a million square miles. How did all these creatures get buried there in the middle of America? And, and if it was a Chicxulub asteroid that killed them, which is way down on the, on the, the Yucatan pen Peninsula, two, two to 3,000 miles away from where these creatures are, how, did it, how is it responsible for burying these creatures all the way up in Canada in mud? And why are they all placed kind of directionally there vertically? It's as if those tsunamis are coming up from the west to the east in waves, burying them in layers, just like what we see them uh, in today. That's a huge area, 1,800 miles long, 1,000 miles wide, a big, huge dinosaur kill zone. And they're buried with ash. So how could such immense ash come up and also be buried in those layers along with mud and sand? It had to be the catastrophic plate tectonics motions that we just talked about. Here's a short video that will um, we'll show that. I don't, I don't think you guys are going to get the audio, so I'll, I'll talk over this one. Okay. Did you guys get the audio on that video? Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, great. No problem. I will talk through it then. So we have these plates that are rapidly subducting, and it's creating volcanism that's coming up, raining down on these dinosaurs, burying them with, with mud and sand. So here's the Independence Dyke Swarm. We see these linear fissures that are going on, and it's a huge system. And watch how much ash it put up here. 4,000 cubic miles of ash. Multiple states are just buried in layers of this stuff. And here's one uh, in Utah where you can see tons and tons of ash just all over the place. By, by comparison, Mount St. Helens that we many of us were alive in the 1980s when that volcano blew up, that produced one quarter of a cubic mile of ash and it covered three states in darkness. So think about this, Mount St. Helens, Washington, 1980s, darkened three states, covered much of Washington with, with ash, and it was one quarter of one cubic mile of ash. The Independence Dyke Swarm that was going on during the flood produced 4,000 cubic miles of ash, covered half the states, and buried all these dinosaurs. And it's interesting, this is a little nuance, but you have to think about this really carefully. Why are these dinosaurs buried with ash and where did it come from? And why are they buried with the mud and sand along with it? There had to be something going on at the time the dinosaurs were dying and being in these buried in these mud stratified layers, something else happening somewhere else that's creating ash that comes from land volcanoes burying with these creatures. Again, uh, I hope you're getting it because it's the most obvious thing in the world. Look at this huge ash piles, 100 feet deep with mud and sand. I'm going to show that one again. That's where they found one of the largest T-Rexes under 100 feet of mud, sand, and ash. There's where the Chicxulub asteroid would have landed, 2,000 miles away from this big massive kill zone. Let's go ahead and drop the rocks. So we'll fly down the Chicxulub asteroid. There's a simulation that people have run. It could not have buried the dinosaurs 1,000 miles away. It's a crazy, really lousy explanation. In fact, there are hundreds of licensed secular geologists that don't believe the Bible at all that have ditched and walked away from the asteroid theory. They're not buying it because for reasons like this, it's quite obvious. You know, you don't have to have a, a degree in, in, in geology to think, my gosh, if Chicxulub hit there, it's gonna cover much of Texas with tsunamis, but what is it gonna do up in Nebraska and South Dakota and North Dakota and Canada? And why are all those creatures buried in the same regions that they are in Montana and in more of the Southern states? 
just uh, amazing, amazing evidence. So we think it was these subducting plates that caused water to come in from the west, going up to the east in layers, burying all these creatures from, from, the, from the west to the east with these repeating tsunamis. That's why we find them buried in stratified layers. So if you step back and look at dinosaur taphonomy, which is study uh, of these of the conditions in which these creatures died, and you just start weighing this stuff out, here's what you're going to find. Mud, sand, and ash. The mud is obvious. It's coming from the water. Sand, you've got ocean floor stuff going on there, and ash from all these subducting plates causing volcanics that are happening along the coastal regions, and that's why we find them buried in those three different products. Here's a subduction that's happening. It's responsible for the mud and the sand. And of course, the action of those subducting plates is causing a lot of heat and friction that's coming up in the form of volcanics like we see in the Independence Dyke Swarm, causing all the ash to come up on land at the same time. That's the trick with understanding how the dinosaurs died is all three products are showing that something's happening worldwide to generate these three things simultaneously. It's not one, not two, it's all three happening at the same time. So let's zoom into just one of these regions in the Morrison Formation uh, in a place called Morrison, Colorado, and look at the extent of these burial grounds where these dinosaurs are buried. If you just look at the Morrison Formation alone, which is a Jurassic formation, it's the region that went first during the flood, um, look at how thick this one region is. So we just stopped, we just at a helicopter view and then came down. Now we're looking at the Morrison Formation. Well, it's about 300 feet thick. So if we were to take a 747 Boeing airliner and fly it head down into the Morrison Formation, that's what it looks like for scale. And this one formation, the Morrison Formation, think about this, it's hard to imagine, 700,000 square miles and 13 states just for that one formation. So 13 states, 300 feet, flood, you know, muddy flood deposit, and that's what it looks like when you put a nose down airplane in the middle. But what about the Empire State Building? Same thing. It's just this huge region. And here's a picture of all of the dinosaur species, 50 of them that are found buried in the same region at the same time in mud, sand, and ash. You guys, if you don't get it by now, you'll never get it. It's the most obvious thing in the world, but it's being obfuscated by the world. There's only one way to take all the dinosaur species in this region, 50 of them, and bury them over 700,000 square miles 300 feet in a 300-foot thick layer at the same time and cover them with mud, sand, and ash. It had to be Noah's flood. That's the only way it can, it's going to happen. We're talking all kinds of different fossil occurrences, 37 different genera, 364 species of plants and animals, and that's just what we found so far. And most experts would say we only know about the top 20% of the Morrison Formation. The rest of it's still buried with all these creatures. So huge extent of, uh, of these fossils here. So let's look at the extent of the fossil record. We've already shown this slide before. Look, it's not just Morrison, uh, Colorado, not just the Morrison Formation with the 13 states. Again, it's a worldwide phenomenon we have all these creatures buried, but let's put on some more evidence here, and it's called fossil correlation. So if the Bible's correct, and we believe that it is, where all the, all the land masses were put together, then the fountains of the great deep broke open and pushed these continents apart, they would have traveled with animals on them being killed while they're traveling. And that's exactly what we see. We see some of these species are buried on four different continents at the same time. But let's just drill into one area. If you were to take the notch of South America here and fit it right into Africa, take a look at all these little green circles here. If we put them together, we know that these continents are fitting. But look at these massive death burial graveyards. When you fit them back together, it's an entire ecosystem that was once living happily ever after in these little eco zones here all of a sudden the fountains of the great deep hit and then start splitting this land mass in half and how do we know this happened look at this if you do counts of the fossil records on either side of these continents with you know with the right side of one continent on the left side of the other it was the same ecosystem that was rapidly split apart and here's here's the key to understanding the whole thing 
these creatures and these plants are buried in the mud that was responsible for their death. So they're not just buried in some overspill. No, they're buried catastrophically and they were killed by whatever processes covered them and then pushed them apart. So we have brothers and sisters or in cousins of the same species that are now 3,000 miles apart that were once together in a snapshot of time and now they're pushed apart. Again, the only way you can do that is with a rapid, relatively fast process. Um, here is a dinosaur soft tissue. So again, if you were to dig that hypothetical six foot tunnel down and grab a whole bunch of dinosaur uh, you know, bones out of, the, of, of that area, here's what you're gonna see. Here's Mark Armitage and a video that was done on Is Genesis History. When you demineralize a triceratops horn, you can pull it and stretch it. The, the, the soft tissue fabric and matrix is still present. You can still pull and stretch these dinosaur bones. Now, no paleontologist in their right mind 10 years ago would have bet anything that this would have been the case. But now we know it to be true. Since about 2005, Mary Schweitzer really started the whole thing. We've actually known about since, uh, soft tissue since about the 1950s. Um, but now we're up to 130 peer-reviewed science journals. These are not creationist publications. 130 peer-reviewed science journals that have substantiated 16 different varieties of soft tissue that are found in dinosaur bones. So it's not just four or five different types. It's all kinds of stuff they're finding in these dinosaur bones. Here's the journal articles here. Uh, actually, I think it's 122 is what we're up to. Now, this is compiled by Brian Thomas with ICR. Brian, actually, Dr. Thomas, got his uh, PhD in paleobiochemistry, spent you know decades of his life studying this stuff. It's just, uh, it's just amazing, quite obvious. And again, those are peer-reviewed science journals, not creationist publications that have substantiated all this fresh stuff. And the last two things that were just found were cartilage and nerve cells. That's uh, soft tissue varieties number 15 and 16. So how in the world are you gonna get a picture of cartilage like this and a nerve cell like that if these creatures really are 65 million years old been sitting turning into rock over millions and millions of years? They're, they're not, they're just thousands of years old. So I think it makes a whole lot more sense that these things are 4,500 years old or thereabouts and not 65 million years old. And I think we'll wrap up with, with this is that, uh, remember I mentioned that the credibility of Christ himself was really hinging on whether the flood happened, but look at what Christ said to us today uh, as a warning. He says, but in, of that day and hour, no one knows. He's talking about his return, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. For just as the days of Noah were, so the coming of the son of man will be. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until that day that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the son of man be. So if I could be so bold as to offer insight of what Christ is saying today or back then is he's saying, look, there was something that hit those people 4,500 years back in the flood that they didn't expect and they were being careless, and they had disregard for God's word and his authority, and they were having a great time and partying and doing all their stuff and, and having marriages and, and the whole bit, and suddenly destruction was upon them. I think what, and this isn't my analogy, this is Christ's metaphor. He's saying just like it was back then, same thing's going to happen in the end times. People are just going to be caring about doing their stuff, and suddenly uh, some supernatural things are gonna happen that they weren't expecting. So regardless of your position on pre-trib, post-trib, whatever it is, I think it you don't have to solve too much to look around in the world today and say there's a lot going on and it's like every 10 years, things are just different. They're just different than they were 10 years ago and 10 years before that. And that's what Christ is saying is, is be ready and give God authority and, and deference, knowing that when God says something's going to happen, it really will. So I think we will wrap up with that, guys. And I would love to get uh, some questions. Uh, hopefully, I didn't rant on too far beyond my time. But uh, oh no, I'm excited about this stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> that I appreciate your passion. 
Yeah, we could listen to you all day, <clears throat> Dr. Dan. So I appreciate oh, that thanks. Uh, <laughs> presentation. You know, we could just wa wrap up the conference there. You touched on so many great <laughs> topics. You're a great presenter, uh, Dan. So you are a, uh, a motivator you. to us at Standing for Truth. Oh, you guys do a great job. I appreciate that. Thanks. Matt, what about you, brother? What did you think of the presentation? I loved it. I liked uh, uh, right near the end there uh, when he was talking about the Pangaea continents and how they ripped apart and they brought the species that were alive at that time with it. Think about that happening in an evolutionary time scale slowly over eons of time. You expect the same species to be, still be standing in those spots <laughs> as it as they slowly drifted mm. into position, leaving, staying in that region. It makes no sense, you know. Hey Amen, guys. And, and, you know, again, by the by disclaimer, it wasn't me that figured these things out. I think that the, the key that I had of understanding these things, it was really a, a gift. The Lord took me on a truth tour because when my world got rocked about 10 years ago, when someone presenting these types of things to me, it really shifted me. I had to buy, well, my research question, I bought thousands of dollars worth of books and DVDs. I flew to Canada. I flew to Montana. I did all this hands-on research my, myself. Self, and about halfway through my 90 day quest of converting to a young earth creationist, you guys, I was just stunned. I was humbled going, wow, I really need to rethink my whole worldview. And for me, it really was a, it was a gift, but, uh, but thanks for that, that compliment. I appreciate that. Amen. Uh, Dr. Dan. So, okay. We've got some questions here and why don't we start with this one? This one's a great question. And you've presented on this one many times. <clears throat> so Taylor K, thank you for your question. And she's asking, why did lifespans drop so rapidly after the flood? You know, th this is something that I hold near and dear to, to, my, uh, to my own heart and to my own uh, affirming of the young earth position because I played a lot with statistics uh, in, in my life and I have a great deference to what they can do and some of the, the power they have at explaining things. And one of the things that, that I noticed as a statistician and many other people have noticed is you have to look at the lifespans of the people before the flood and ask yourself this question. Why was there a real consistent lifespan of the patriarchs before the flood that averaged about 912 years? Everyone's living, you know, 800 years old, 900 years old, 930, 950, 969 was Methuselah. Why, why was it those 10 patriarchs living an average of 912 years and all of a sudden you have the flood event where of the world's population at that time, let's say it was millions of people, we bottleneck them all down to just eight. You've, you've got Noah and his wife and Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their three wives, and they get on board the ark. So there's a, there's a genetic bottleneck event, and all these eight people get on the ark, and then they get off the ark a year later and then reproduce just within that gene pool of eight people. And their kids have kids, and we go from, you know, six couples, you know, 32 and 64. It compounds really, really quickly. But here's the that the trick that every analytical person should pick up, it didn't go from 912 year lifespan down to 70, it didn't fall off a cliff. It's, it goes down what's called a power law curve where it exponentially declines and decreases over time of several hundred years. And there's no way the early Bible writers could have fabricated this. I mean, you really have two options. Either the Bible writers were recording real lifespans and ages and they were being truthful about it, or they were writing, they were lying about the ages and they all knew polynomial math to slowly decay the curve over time mathematically. And there's no way those guys were doing that stuff back then in cahoots, dozens of the writers all together systematically declining the lifespan. So the short of it is that um, uh, Dr. John Sanford, a Cornell trained PhD geneticist, wrote a book called uh, Entropy. And he explains how when you take the human gene pool of millions of people and bottleneck it down to just eight people, that the, the mutations now in our gene pool after sin begin exponentially increasing. So the mutations and the defects get higher and higher as the couples reproduce. And then our lifespans begin slowly declining. And it perfectly fits the data. In fact, the, the power law curve 
mathematically, I think it has this thing called an R square of about 92%. So 92% of the data points fall along the predicted line. It's uncanny. So that is, is yet another um, evidence for me that just exhaustively uh, proves the flood because these Bible writers would have had no motivation for making this stuff up. And now we know through genetics why they would have had systematically declining lifespans and not just going from 900 years down to like 100 or, or 70 or whatever. So uh, hopefully that answers that. Uh, that question. Absolutely. You showed in your last presentation, Dan, that systematic decline through a biological decay curve. And as, yeah. as you're pointing out, yeah. they would require advanced knowledge in mathematics and biology to be able to make that up. Exactly. It's just, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible. But again, for, for me, it's just, uh, it's more affirmation um, that God's word is true. All the way through. To so think about it this way, one more thing, Donnie, on that yeah. is not all, that that proves the pre-flood world and the flood event and the Genesis genealogies afterwards. Because if you right. were to take Luke chapter three and the seventy-seven genealogies, the patriarchs that are listed from Jesus all the way back to Adam, those lifespans systematically decline. So it proves the fabric of history that leads from Adam, the first man to Christ our Lord, 4,000 years after history. The second Adam, that's amazing, brother. Yeah. So yeah. a follow-up question then, would you argue that this problem of deleterious mutation accumulation that Dr. John Sanford talks about in his book, Genetic Entropy, this would put shelf lives on genomes and basically limit the maximum lifespan of species, as in species could not, go back millions of years like the evolutionists want because of mutation accumulation? You know, I think that would be a great question for someone like Rob Carter at CMI. Who's, I think he's got uh, specifically some analyses on that. And I think uh, Nathaniel Jensen has also d done that. I haven't read any specific papers myself on how what we just described about entropy would put capstone on, on animals. But I, I can tell you this much. I went to a museum once in Montana and uh, it was a creation museum. And the guy brings us in the back and he says, hey, check a, take a look at this turtle. And he says, this is one of the, it's like tied, or it's one of the top two largest turtles in the world. And the thing was the size of a VW bus. It was huge. It was like eight or 10 feet in circumference, this turtle shell. And he says, you know what? The turtles grow as long as they're alive. And this is a pre-flood turtle because it's been found in Noah's flood layers. And it was that that moment I realized that God gave me a gift that I could have been looking at the turtle serial number one. <laughs> if that turtle was 1,656 years old, if you follow the Masoretic text, right. that could have been the first turtle ever made <laughs> that was living <laughs> until it was buried. You know, so in turtles today, they only live three or 400 years. So um, absolutely, the fallen world does suppress. It has a suppressive effect on everything, on health, vitality, and lifespan. So uh, genetics and mutation all play into that. And I think the decreasing lifespans in humans as well as animals would, would play into that. Amen. Well said. Great answer. Okay, so this next question that comes in is another common one. And the chat's moving quick, so hopefully I didn't lose it. No, nope, here it is. Okay, so it comes in from Echoing Erudite. Question for Dan. <clears throat> what is the response to the skeptic that asks, where are all the human remains from the flood? Why don't we find mass graves for them, even in the mass dinosaurs graves? Yeah, so there's there's three things on that. But before we get to that, first, I would refer people to a, a video that we have on that same title, Why Don't We Find Humans Buried with Dinosaurs? Um, it's on our YouTube channel, and I think that's what it's called, Why Don't We Find Human Fossils Buried with Dinosaurs? But let, let's uh, that's the name of the video. So watch that for a fuller length uh, explanation. I'll give you the short version here. Uh, that question used to trouble me too. I'm like, my gosh, if there's humans existing with dinosaurs, we should find some together. So there, there's actually four things on that. Um, side note, ask John Mackay this question. He'll blow you away with some amazing, amazing stuff. So the, the four things are this. Let's start with scripture. Scripture says, so God, you would say, 
is a man of his word, all right, or a father uh, of his word, right? And he said in Genesis 6, I will destroy them, corrupt mankind he's talking about, I will destroy them with the earth. So God himself says, I'm going to use the earth as a tool for eradicating or recycling humans. I'm going to scrub the earth of these people. And that's exactly what he did. He just wiped wiped them out. I mean, look, you look at the fact today that you got to dig down 400 feet to some, find some dinosaur species. What on earth happened to the humans? Well, that's one thing to think about. The other thing to think about is that humans are smart and they would have survived to the very, very end. And that goes with the third thing, which is just the word time. So if the flood didn't zenith, for 150 days and it was coming up in stages and you look at the flood mega sequences like the sock the tip of canoe and the kaskaskia which is the first three sloths mega sequences of the flood that we have buried in layers today 80 or 90 percent of those first three layers are all marine it was all the ocean creatures that were getting paid off first they're getting buried in tsunami wave after tsunami wave after tsunami wave and if you're a human you're smart you're running for high ground how far can humans travel in five months a long long time and even when you get to the place you're going to travel you could make rafts and makeshift rafts and float on things for a while and then you're going to die you're going to drown you're going to float and you're going to bloat and then you're going to decay so that's really what happened to the humans and the fourth thing I'll say is that um, I, I'm a believer in this, but many other creationists are not. Um, I, I do believe that there are several valid examples of pre-flood fossilized human remains that are found in dinosaur layers. Again, it's it's a very divisive talk, uh, topic to, to bring up. But ask John Mackay that question because he was taken downstairs in a basement with a fossilized human and had the evolutionist confess to him that, quote, we have hundreds of human fossilized remains. We just don't display them in museums. Now, that's hearsay, but it's from a really reliable guy that I trust, John McKay, who's not motivated to lie about this stuff. He was down in a basement looking at one and had a renowned uh, a renowned anthropologist say, oh yeah, we've got hundreds of examples of fossilized humans and things like this when he was looking at one encased in limestone, mm -hmm. which is Cretaceous stuff. So I've seen enough things like that and heard enough things that I think there are all kinds of examples of pre-flood humans that have been buried, but there are lots, a lot of creationists that that um, are not going to go there until there's a documented case where this is, a, you know, where you go bury it off and, and barricade it and do a systematic dig and prove it and take samples and all that stuff. But I've seen enough to convince me personally that there are a lot of pre-flood humans remains, not, not a lot, but some, so... But we've got a whole video on that that answers the question in a longer way. That's a great response. I, I really appreciate your answers, how thorough they are. Yes, we well, we have John McKay tomorrow, and we've had him on many times. We did a flood boundaries con conference with John McKay, and he covered wow. a lot of that evidence you're talking about, and it really is fascinating. So great. glad you brought it up, my brother. Sure. Okay. All right, Matt, we'll uh, put the next question up for you to read. Here's another common one that I'm sure you're familiar with, Dan. Oh, yeah. How did kangaroos and other animals make it to their present locations after the flood? Australia, for example. Yes. Well, I wish I could say it with John's accent. You get to ask him the same question. He, he would say they hopped or they walked just like the humans did thousands of years ago. But listen, yeah. that that is a very good question because if you look at the fossil data, there isn't much. And so people are trying to scrap and use inference to figure out how that would happen because you would hope that you would have a nice little trail going across. If you look at our FAQ book, our answers to the top 50 questions book, I have a few pages that do deal with this dealing specifically with Australia and kangaroos. And we ran some feasibility analyses there of how many miles kangaroos could travel from the ark along uh, reproducing along the way to get to Australia because we have to deal with the sea level change when, when after Noah's flood and the ice age hit we have a, a sea level change of a, maybe about 100 meters or so I'm not sure in particular in that region but overall there was a big level of of, uh, of, of the sea level that was changing and plenty of land bridges existed and later during the ice age you have ice bridges that existed in different regions around the world that would have allowed for animal travel. But that's a great question. We have one that's specific uh, to just kangaroos in our book. So 
grab that and that will help. Absolutely. Great stuff, Dan. So next one comes in from Josh Musix. And I do appreciate how engaged our audience is. We've still got about 75 live and lots of uh, great feedback, uh, Dan, towards your great. presentation. So Josh is asking, great. why did God want more of some animals and only two of others? You know, um, that has been um, a very interesting question. I've seen lots of, of conjecture and speculation about is it is it uh, two and then seven? Is it seven of the of, of, of one variety or is it seven pair? There's lots of scholastic dialogue that goes along with that. But I really don't know. I wouldn't be willing to, to guess why God wanted it that way. But we do know that scripture says it that way. So I, I, don't, I, I can't uh, I can't imagine why God would, would do that. I haven't studied that that answer or that topic in, in particular. Have you guys seen anything? Uh, that would deal with that? I've heard two answers. Um, one okay. of them was that um, they, they were clean animals, so that some of the clean would be uh, considered uh, sacrificial, and they would be I've heard worthy that too. of gods. Uh, yeah. Another one would yeah. be that because they would be food for carnivores, that they would also need to be more than just a single pair, because they, um, you know, if you've got a lion pair, and then you've got a single pair of cattle, it won't take long for the cat to eradicate them. So they would be they would be clean also for the carnivore animals as where they were brought less of. Um, I've heard another one. But, um, okay. Yeah. That, that, that's a great question, Josh. I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I don't like standing on things if I really don't know a solid answer and I just have not studied that in particular. So uh, you've got me there. That That's a, that's a great question. Well, great responses or preliminary thoughts from Matt and Dan. So this one is yeah. going to comprise more, you know, we could theorize, I guess. But yeah. Mountain Hours, <clears throat> $10 Super Chat, I appreciate the support. How many people do you think uh, existed before the flood, uh, Dan? Yeah, so let's just put this purely in the opinion box. And right. I, I would say there's a few million and I know there's people that would disagree with that, but the command of God was to be fruitful and multiply, and they weren't necessarily doing that. You know, right. the Bible says that all flesh on earth had corrupted itself, and it was also a different terrain, and it was also um, all that there was one massive land mass. But if you've got 1,656 years and the patriarchs are living 912 years, now this isn't Bible, but the, the Jewish tradition, I believe, says that Adam and Eve had 37 kids. I think it was, again, that's more of a, of a belief than, than, than Bible. But if you, if you add all that up in these generations, um, again, they're only naming certain patriarchs in the Bible. Uh, I think most creationists would give it a, a, you know, a two to three million uh, value, but that would be just a guess. I certainly personally wouldn't feel that there would be billions. I, I, I would think that would right. be a big stretch. Um, but I, I think maybe a few million. And I, I also personally believe from the fossil record and based upon the things that we see, um, the, that the humans made it uh, like onto the granite shields and everything by the, the, by the time the flood had reached its peak. Um, so uh, I don't think there was a, there, there was a, a big population. I think they're probably congregated in certain areas, probably away from all the, the big crazy dinosaurs. Right. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be yeah. living next to a T-Rex. And I think, yeah. I agree with you just a few million because God said, be fruitful and multiply. But the Bible says about the pre-flood world that the thoughts in every man's mind was wicked. They clearly weren't following God's command. And so I think that goes back to the earlier question that you gave a great answer to. Why don't we find much in terms of human remains? Well, God creates two people, Adam and Eve. But then I'm assuming millions of animal species worldwide. And so what do we find? millions to billions of animal fossils, very few humans, because there were very few humans, as you pointed out. Good point. Good point. And they're probably started out with, uh, you know, with just thousands of kinds that Adam was able to, to name within one earth rotation day. But right. then I think they speciated a lot after that. Yeah. Right. Good okay. Point. Well, here, here's our last question. Dan, I always appreciate your time. Again, I know how busy you are, and so we greatly appreciate uh, how generous you are with it. So great answers so far. Great questions from the audience, all very much on topic. I appreciate that. And so here's the last question. This comes down to many in the old earth and theistic evolution camp. They'll look to what's called the local flood model, as you know, Dan. 
and they argue that the Genesis flood was universal, but not worldwide. <clears throat> They'll say it was universal to Noah's world at that time. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the the first thing you have to think about that is that if, if there were other humans at the time and Noah's flood was not worldwide, then that would make God's judgment incomplete and not reaching as far as what he said it was going to be because he said, behold, all earth has corrupted itself, and so I will judge them. I'm going to remove them. I'm going to wipe them out with the earth. It's, all of mankind's going to die, everything outside the earth. There are about 60 different textual clues you can get from Genesis 6 to 9 that it was, in fact, a worldwide flood. Um, I dealt with this topic for about an hour in a flood talk that I gave at uh, the Alpha Omega Conference. So if you look at that talk, it was a couple years ago, and it's called Was was Locals, was Gen was uh, Noah's Flood Worldwide or Local? And uh, but I think for me, theologically, I would have big problems with that because Jesus said the flood came and took all of them away. God's judgment was complete. It was holistic to all of mankind. All flesh on earth had corrupted itself. So, so if God's judgment was because, quote, all flesh on earth had corrupted itself, then why would his judgment be only local? You would think that the judgment would be commensurate with the sentencing. And that's exactly what happened with Genesis 6 with the worldwide flood is that God says, I'm going to, everything's corrupt. So I'm going to judge everything and wipe the whole thing out. But I think geologically you have these packages and pancakes of sedimentary layers that span entire continents. So it, it was very obviously a, a worldwide flood. But, but if, of course we have, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ that don't believe in young earth that hold to a local flood model and that's something that they're going to have to grapple with. But but personally, I, I don't believe it was a local flood for reasons that are both theological and geological. Yeah, so, I find it, oh, go Matt, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. I said, uh, yeah, I always find it strange that um, God gave the rainbow to man and never flood the earth locally, but there's local floods all the time. Kind of there you go. <laughs> that's another one. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Yeah. And in light of what you were saying about these massive sedimentary rock layers, Dan, that extend across entire continents and even further, these mega sequences, your old earther or just somebody who rejects the flood, they're going to have to admit that the entire earth was once underwater, but they're going to have to argue it's at different points in time, multiple local floods. It, it seems like uh, it's, it's a stretch rather than just, as you pointed out, seeing the evidence for what it is and and accepting it yeah i'm not far from uc davis uh maybe uh, 50 miles from where i live and there's a famous award-winning geologist there who's since passed away and in the 1970s he came out with ironclad emphatic proof of a worldwide flood that not a lot of people know about but he called it something way different he called it the quote late cretaceous transgression <laughs> And here's what he did that's just amazing to me. It, it absolutely proves catastrophic plate tectonics. He proved that 50% of the fossils in the Cretaceous layers are higher than today's ocean level could have covered. Wow. So you have to have pushing and bending and warping on the land masses from pressures going on from the ocean to push up and buckle the land masses and push these Cretaceous fossils higher than the current ocean level is. So in, in, in techno speak with big words like the late Cretaceous transgression, <laughs> he says worldwide flood. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It, it's another yeah, way of it's, saying it's, worldwide flood without actually having to acknowledge the Genesis flood yeah, from the Bible. Exactly. <clears throat> Second Peter three says in the last days, there's going to be scoffers denying three things, the creation, the world wide flood, the world that then was being overflowed with water and perished and the coming judgment. One thing I noticed about your teaser trailer, uh, Dan was you touch on the flood salvation and end times. And I think that's awesome. Mm. Yeah, like I said, I've got lots of brothers and sisters that are all over the map on their eschatological uh, beliefs and, and everything. But, um, but you know, I, for me, you just read scripture and look around. Read scripture, look around. And then Jesus spoke in a lot of metaphors, but the one that just gets me, 
So my wife and I have had four kids. You know, she's had four kids to get to watch the whole process. But in every time she went into labor, two things happened, just like Christ says. The, the frequency of the contractions increased and right. the intensity increased. So they would go from 20 minutes apart to 15 minutes apart to 12 minutes apart to 10 minutes apart. And then at each time, the pain also increased. And that's Jesus says the end times are going to be just like that. So I'm in my 50s now, and I've watched birth pains happening yeah. worldwide, and they're getting, they're increasing in frequency and intensity. And I'm not a doom and gloomer in everything. I do think prophecy and in, in the, in the Bible, you read through, you know, the different books in the Bible that talk about end times. And I think we are heading down a narrow chasm right now that could be whatever it's going to be. Uh, and I do believe that Jesus is coming back. And I think that a lot of what's going on in the world could be shaping up for that. It looks to me like the chessboard is being set, right. but the pieces aren't necessarily in motion with a lot of speed yet. But I think all the pieces are being laid out. So, um, but for me, I'm going to have peace and I'm going to run my lane. I'm not going to spend time glued to doom and gloom on YouTube stuff. All I have bandwidth right now is to run my lane and do what my father wants me to do. And I'm going to be faithful to that. I've got a family and ministry and work, and I don't have time to soak in the doom and gloom stuff. You know, if Jesus comes back, you know, next week, I, I hope I'm ready and faithful. And, and ready. Well, right. I, I know I'm already ready because I'm, I, I'm once saved, always saved. I believe that firmly. And it's not mm -hmm. my salvation work, it's his. So, um, but I just want to be faithful until that day. Mm -hmm. and, and Christ does the saving work. So I don't know when it's going to be, but I've seen a lot happen in my lifetime. If you were to go back to my 18 year old self <laughs> and say, hey, Dan, did you know that when you're 54 years old, you're going to be able to walk down the street and buy marijuana legally from these dispensaries? And that this is going to happen and this is going to happen and people are going to say this about God and this about society and, and the gender fluid. It's uh, all the stuff that's going on. I wouldn't have believed it as an 18 year old. You know, if you get caught smoking a joint when I was 18, they put you in jail. Right. <laughs> there was morality and consequences. And, and if, you know, when I was a kid, if, if you were doing something stupid and your neighbor's mom saw you doing it, she would grab you by the ear and take you to your parents who would then deal with you. You know, so it's a whole different landscape mm -hmm. right now in every way, shape and form. And I'm watching that unfold. And I don't want to be like a lobster that's being boiled two degrees at a time until it gets boiled. You know, I want to keep I want to be like the sons of Issachar and study the times. So but right now, my lane is to just get out the Genesis 1 to 11 truth, because if people can get that done right, they're going to have roots and then they're going to produce fruit. And that's God's work because his word says that his word will never come back void, but will always accomplish a purpose for which he sent it. So Amen. that's why I love your guys' ministry. You guys are just pushing the word out. The word does the work. <laughs> the word does the heavy lifting. And you guys are just unleashing it. So great job. Well, based on what you said there, my brother, we've got a lot in common, Dan. So I really appreciate uh, those right. words, those words of encouragement. Uh, you're doing the Lord's work and you're aware of the signs Thank of the times. And many would say we are living uh, the book of Revelation. We're, we're living in some very interesting times. And as you've demonstrated, Dan, it's a great time to be a biblical creationist. You provided us some oh, amazing is. evidence. Yeah. This was the perfect way to kickstart our conference. And so, Matt, I guess I'll hand great. it to you. Any final words, final thoughts from you? Uh, yeah, I, we got a super chat actually from George Bond for 20. Um, he said, this is worth a donation right here. He said, they just discovered a new species of creature. It is um, it is a giant pink isopod and it's a bone eating creature. And it's on the bottom of the ocean and it consumes the bones of an organisms that fall to the bottom of the, uh, the water. <laughs> So uh, that would pretty much get rid of fossils, uh, you know, over slow geologic time. Right. Ooh, interesting. That's great. Very cool. Okay. Well, Dan, again, I appreciate your time. Time has flown by with you. Your presentations, I always end up watching a dozen times because I always catch something new every time. You do such a fantastic oh, job. You really are a blessing. Uh, Dan, any final words, final thoughts from you? You guys, I just, I just think my, my final admonition is we got to remember why does God enlighten us to these kind of things? You know, well, why, why do we realize that this is true? It, it all points to Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. Mm -hmm. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's an incredible alignment between Genesis one and John one, 
And, and what this truth ought to do is to compel us to tell people about Christ. You know, it all comes back to our creator and we know it's true. Uh, many on your, on your, on your show here know it's true. So then what we want to grow richly in God's word and then do what Ephesians two says to be prepared to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So um, that would be my final thing, but God, God bless you guys. And thank you so much for having me on and happy to do it again sometime and go watch our movie, go to Noah's flood.com and sign up for the, for the updates there. Absolutely. Great final words. I love the way you put it a couple of times. If, if, if you have a strong root, you're going to produce fruit. And that's what it's all about. And so right here, I do have uh, your free Genesis Apologetics app. And also, uh, please, to the audience, go subscribe to Genesis Apologetics. And also take advantage of their website. Trust me, there's endless content. Uh, Dan, you are doing a fantastic job. Uh, for those wondering, real quick, final thoughts. Matt will be back here in about an hour and a half. Animals on Noah's Ark. You don't want to miss that. And then we'll be back here again tomorrow very early from Boomerangs to Babel and back. John Mackay and Indiana Joe. So I like that title. Okay. So with that, <laughs> they've always got great titles, Dan. So, okay. We're awesome. wrapping. God bless, Dan. God bless, uh, Matt. Thanks, guys. And to the audience, we're out. God bless you both. God bless.